I am so glad to be here. This is just about the perfect way to top off a th wonderful Thanksgiving day for me. I just thank God for it. Um, we're going to continue this series tonight called Hollerack. And uh, let's begin with prayer. God, we come here as broken people. We always do. But you are the God of healing and wholeness, and that's why we're here. We're come fully expecting that you're going to hear our pleas, hear our cries, and deal with our brokenness through the power of your Holy Spirit and your presence in this place tonight. May you open our hearts uh, for those who have closed our hearts to you, and uh, let us hear the good word that can bring life where there's been death. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're talking about Hollerack over the next few weeks. Last, uh, last week, Mark talked about uh, well, we talked about those things that can really kind of cause us to enter into uh, relapse, um, the, back into bondage where we uh, don't really want to go back, and um, uh, that gives us the motivation uh, to keep us in, in bondage, whether we're sober or not sober. Uh, and when I say sober... I'm talking about all addictions. I'm not talking just about codependency like me uh, to those who are addicted to food, pornography, alcohol, drugs. I'm also talking about those who are stuck in their grief. And there are a lot of people who are stuck in their grief for a variety of reasons. By the way, I didn't tell you who I am. I'm, I'm Larry, and, and I am really uh, uh, not only a believer but a follower in Jesus Christ. And I struggle, as I just said, mightily with <clears throat> codependency. Uh, I just try to fix everybody. And I can't even fix myself. Uh, but the holidays, uh, for some reason, bring out the best or sometimes bring out the absolute worst in us. Um, it, they become a major struggle, a uh, hurdle for those of us who are struggling with addiction for some reason. And, and part of it is, it is a time of enormous stress and also what I think is unrealistic expectations. Uh, we all want the Norman Rockwell Thanksgiving, right? Uh, uh, we want the Norman Rockwell Christmas, but reality tells us we're more, more like the Griswolds, if you know anything about the National Lampoon uh, family. So we struggle mightily, and like I said last week, Mark uh, Beebe was talking about loneliness, and tonight uh, I want to talk about an affliction that can haunt all of us, self-pity. Uh, Self-pity is one of the tools that the enemy uses to keep us sick and in bondage to our addiction. And, and self-pity is really more than just feeling sorry for yourself. Self-pity includes refusing to accept responsibility for who you are and what you're doing. See, we love being the victim. We love playing the blame game, right? Right? Whenever bad things happen in our lives, it's always somebody else's fault. And while there may be legitimate reasons for the pain in your life, where there may have been some traumatic event in your childhood, while you may have struggled, struggled with some sort of hellish time in your history, it's still your responsibility to move into a place of healing and wholeness. No one can do that for you. We all have our excuses. <laughs> we say things like, well, Thanksgiving and Christmas has always been sheer hell for me when I was growing up. Everybody was drunk. My mom and dad were always fighting. Dad always drank up all the little bit we had for gift money. If you had parents or a husband or a wife or children or aunts or uncles or cousins or friends like mine, you'd drink too. You just take your pick. We all have our excuses, and we're excellent at playing the blame game. We are the victim. And we see things. Well, did you see that jerk in traffic just now? Did you see that? I think I'll have to go home and have a drink or a snort or a toke or a pill to calm my nerves. And when I get home, I'm going to make sure that everyone there knows how angry and out of control I am, and I'll probably need another 
drink or snort or toke or pill or two or three or four in order to calm me, to make me as calm as I can possibly be, unless everything is not exactly the way I want it to be, and everyone is not behaving exactly like I want them to behave, or until I pass out. And we actually believe this crap. It makes perfect sense to us. Well, we're going to talk to our so-called friends. And, of course, they're addicts too. And I mean they're such good counselors. And they give us such good advice because they have done such a good job of handling their lives. And they will tell us that we're right. That's really all we want to know, that we're right. Of course we're right. I mean, when you're, when you're drunk or high or grieving or eating your way through that gallon of Blue Bell or haagen or always trying to fix someone, you are always justified in what you are doing. So go ahead. You deserve it. It's not your fault, right? And I got to say this. I, I know I'm being a little hard on us. But we don't intentionally think this way. We don't want it to be that way. We don't set out to create the kind of havoc or pain or difficulty in our lives or in the lives of those that we say we love. And we know the insanity of all of this in our more sane moments. And that's when we start feeling, if we have feelings at all, of remorse. Remorse. And then we feel the pain. <laughs> and when we feel the pain, what do we want to do? Let's have another. You know, part of the difficulty lies in the fact that we feel like we are somehow entitled to have what we want when we want it. Our expectations are distorted by our inability to understand this one thing, that the universe does not revolve around me or you. At the height of our addiction, we are the most self-centered people on the face of this planet, and somehow, some way. We have gotten the impression that God has gotten tired of being God and we will take over for a little while. That's pretty stupid. This is what we say. Well, God, things aren't exactly as I had imagined. So why don't you just come down off the throne there for a little while and let me sit there for a while and... And let me make some decisions for my life. And God says, well, what about others? Well, others, well, they'll be fine. I just need to work on me because that's all that's really important right now. I'll focus on others when I get my stuff together. Thanks for understanding. <laughs> I'll be God for a while. <laughs> How many of you saw the movie Bruce Almighty? <laughs> See, that's what it makes me think of. You know, life wasn't going his way, so he decided he was going to take over for God, and he gets so frustrated trying to answer everyone's prayers that he just started pressing yes for everything. He answers everybody, yes, yes, whatever you want. And, and, and so there were some pretty remarkable things that happened. One guy said he'd lost 40 pounds on the Krispy Kreme diet, <laughs> which is one of my dreams. <laughs> uh, one guy was six inches taller, and... I mean, just all kinds of silliness. You see, we think sometimes that we can do a, a better job of running the universe than God because things are not going exactly the way we want them to go. So I got to ask you, how's that working for you? Being God, trying to be in control. Well, here's a new sash for you. God is God and you're not. Amen? Amen. Say it with me. God is God, and you are not. God is God, I'm not. There you go. So right now, right now, 
You can stop blaming God and everyone else for how your life has turned out. See, God is not into fairness as we understand fairness. God is into mercy. God is into justice. God is into healing. God is into making you whole again. God is into defeating the lies of the enemy. God knows you better than you know yourself. In the 139th Psalm, it says, God knit us together in our mother's womb. And God loves you with a love that will never, 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 never let you go. And that's the truth. Amen? I want you to hear this scripture. Soon another feast came around, and Jesus was back in Jerusalem. Near the Sheep Gate in Jerusalem, there was a pool in Hebrew called Bethesda with five alcoves. Hundreds of sick people, blind, crippled, paralyzed, were in these alcoves. One man had been an invalid there for 38 years. When Jesus saw him stretched out at the pool and knew how long he had been there, he said, do you want to get well? And the sick man said, uh, well, sir, when the water is stirred, I don't have anybody to put me in the pool. And by the time I get there, somebody else is already in. And Jesus said, get up, take your bedroll and start walking. And the man was healed on the spot. He picked up his bedroll and he walked off. So here is a man, not unlike you and me, bound up, paralyzed by fear, paralyzed by our addiction, unable to take the step. Jesus asks this man if he wants to get well, just like Jesus asks us, do we want to get well? And he immediately starts making excuses. Well, I would, you know, I've been here for 38 years and I was waiting for somebody to get me in the pool, but by the time the water stirred, there's somebody else in there. Well, you know, this is the way it is. 38 years. Now healing was standing right in front of him. And here's the thing it was there all the time, he couldn't see it. So he just laid there in bondage. And it's like Jesus gets tired of this man's whining and he says, get up and walk right now. Forget about the pool. Pick up your bedroll. Go walk. Then the story goes on. That day happened to be the Sabbath. The Jews stopped the healed man and said, it's the Sabbath. You can't carry your bedroll around. It's against the rules. But he told him, the man who made me well told me to. He said, take your bedroll and start walking. And they asked, well, who gave you the order? Take it up and start walking. But the healed man didn't know where Jesus had slipped away in the crowd. And a little later, Jesus found him in the temple and he said, you look wonderful. You're well. Don't return to a sinning life or something worse might happen. The man went back told the Jews that it was Jesus who had made him well, and that's why the Jews were out to get Jesus, because he did this kind of thing on the Sabbath. But Jesus defended himself. My father is working straight through, even on the Sabbath, and so am I. Now that really set them off. The Jews were now not only out to expose him, they were out to kill him. Not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was calling God his own father, putting himself on the level of God. So Jesus explained himself at length. I'm telling you this straight. The son can't independently do a thing. Only what he sees the father doing. What the father does, the son does. The Father loves the Son and includes Him in everything He is doing. But you haven't seen the half of it yet. For in the same way that the Father raises the dead and creates life, 
so does the Son. The Son gives life to anyone he chooses. Neither he nor the Father shuts anyone out. Amen. Now, I want to tell you something. Right there is a promise we can stake our lives on, right? Neither the Son of Man, Jesus, nor the Father shuts anyone out. It doesn't matter how far away you have strayed from God. It doesn't matter whether you even believe in God. God will never shut you out. It doesn't matter what you have done. It doesn't matter what you are doing. It doesn't matter at all. The Father will never shut you out. That's good news, friends. <laughs> That's good news. Here's the problem that many of us don't believe in this God. If we believe in God at all, we believe in a God that is truly giving us what we deserve. We have been so bad that we deserve what we are getting, and it comes from this God. We don't deserve anything better. This is our lot in life. It is our punishment for all the pain we have inflicted on us and everyone around us. Life is hell now and will be forever. Let me tell you something right now. That might, right there, that right there is the biggest lie ever told by the enemy. Ever. If we believe the enemy then we will stay in our bondage. We will never taste the freedom that God desires for us. God will use the suffering. God will use the pain. And God will redeem it and use it as a launching pad to set us free. You see, our pain is the touchstone to all spiritual progress. That's step 10 in the 12 by 12. Our pain is the touchstone to all spiritual progress. Our, so our pain, our struggles, our suffering can be used by this God who gave life for us, sacrificed his only son for us, desires only freedom for us, for you, for me, forever and ever. Amen? Let me tell you this. I've got the cutest, most cherubic grandson on the face of this earth. It's true. I'll show you pictures after the service. I love him beyond anything I can imagine. And I love my children the same way. I love my wife the same way. And I want to tell you something. As I have been here for a couple of years, I love you all too. I love you I would do just about, being codependent, I'll do just about anything for you, <laughs> you know? <clears throat> but this is something that I could never do, never. I could never allow my son to die for you. I could never allow my daughter to die for you. I could never allow my grandson to die for you. I couldn't do it. I just could as much as I love you, I could not do that. But friends, <laughs> that's exactly what God did for us. That is the most incredibly good news, the most powerful thing that we could ever stand on in our lives. God loved us enough to sacrifice his only son so that we may have life both now and forever and ever. Amen? Amen? God did that so that we can be raised from the dead. Not just in the life to come, but in our life right now. I don't know if I ever shared this story with you. I was standing out front greeting like I typically do on a Thursday night. And uh, these two women walked in. And they were dressed to the nine, man. They had on hats. They had just, I mean, they looked like they stepped out of a, a Christopher Banks catalog. They were uh, probably my age, maybe a little older. <clears throat> and um, I, I shook their hands. I said, welcome. Glad you're here. And, uh, 
I said, well, you know, there's all kinds of folk that come to recovery. Um, they came in and they, walk, they stayed for about five minutes. And then I see them, they come up to me and they said, you know, I think we're in the wrong place. And I said, really? He said, yeah, we're looking for a funeral. And I said, well, that's probably across the street in the main sanctuary over there. That's probably where you need to go. And so they got about halfway across the parking lot. And I yelled out. And I said, hey, hey, hey. And they turned around. And I said, we raised the dead in here. <laughs> well, uh. They just kind of looked at me and said, boy, you're just an idiot. And they turned around and walked. <laughs> they didn't get it. But here's the caveat. Here's the catch. We can't do this alone. We need each other. We need people around us who see through the self-pity. We need people around us who see through the blaming. We see we need people around us who, who understand the victim mentality, the self-centeredness, and they will tell us the truth. <laughs> Trust me on this one. You are not the only one who has ever gone through what you're going through. I don't care what you've gone through. Most of us who are in addiction suffer from what is called terminal uniqueness. No one understands what I've endured in my life, in my journey. Blah, 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 blah. This is what open share groups are for. Because there are stories shared in these groups that are your story. And the folks in these groups have amazing, amazingly sensitive BS detectors. And they will tell you in as loving a way as possible, and sometimes not even a loving way, that you're full of it. A good sponsor will do the same thing. Listen, honesty is essential to healing and sobriety and recovery and avoiding relapse. So here we are on Thanksgiving Day, and perhaps maybe for you it's been the day from hell. I don't know. Maybe it has been sheer joy. I suspect that if it was a day of joy, it's because you understand what it means to be grateful and thankful and that God has touched your heart in a way that keeps you from ever going back to that place again that was so hurtful and painful. Listen, gratitude is the cure for hopelessness. And I am grateful you're here tonight. Maybe you are here to start what you think is the most impossible journey. Oh, let me tell you this. This was true for me, and I know it would be true for you. If you take the first step toward Jesus, then Jesus will be with you the rest of the way. Amen. I am living proof of that truth. And so I'm going to ask you, to take the first step tonight if you haven't already done that. And if you have already done, begun the journey, then come and get on your knees and give thanks to this God who never, never, never lets us go. Amen? Thanks be to God. Amen.